Hello, good morning to everyone. We're going to start just in one minute. I apologize for the short delay. In the meantime, I would just like to make a short announcement about interpretation as um, we're having some technical problems for this session. Uh, always do, I think, to the problems with flights. So we will have for the entire, do for the entire meeting full interpretation into English, German, and Spanish. And from the debate on the resolution, uh, meaning so around 9.30, 9.45, we will also have interpretation into Russian, uh, French, and Italian. Um, unfortunately, this will be affecting this session uh, and also the first committee session only, so hopefully afterwards it should be fine. But please bear with us um, if there could be some issues. So repeating, German, Spanish, and English provided throughout the session, Italian, French, and Russian, only from the debate onwards. So, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I, I'm just waiting for the ending of the different political meetings that are being held this morning. So, but if you don't mind, I will, I will start. So, good morning to, to all. Uh, um, I, uh, I call the meeting of the General Committee on Economic Affairs, Science, Technology, and Environment to Order. Uh, there is an agenda, as you all know, colleagues. Uh, it has been distributed. So I could ask you if there is any objection to the agenda, please. So if you do not disagree, the agenda, dear colleagues, is adopted. Uh, as is adopted, there is no one, but I imagine that one to, uh, to run against. So uh, for me and uh, all members of this committee, it's a pleasure for me to chair. Uh, uh, the second committee, and I, we've, I would like to give you, in the name of the other group, um, a warm welcome to the, to the debate, to the meeting. And the committee is staffed by Vice Chair Mr. Artur Grasimov, uh, the Director for Economic and Environmental Security, uh, Mr. Marco Bonavello, my right, and Procedural Advisor from the United Kingdom House of Commons, Mr. Alex Knight. So I'm going to start with some remarks from my from my perspective, and uh, before giving the floor to Gudrun, to our rapporteurs, I would like to also to give uh, the opportunity to have a vision from the Ukrainian perspective to Artur, to our vice chair, and then I think he has to leave, but we will do a sort of backwards and forwards, and he has to come back, then we will be able to take part in the discussion. So uh, let, me, let me start with my opening remarks, dear colleagues. <coughs> I'm very pleased to welcome you to the, to the meeting. And uh, yesterday also already Roberto Montera, the Secretary General, and the President uh, also said that uh, it was a pleasure to, to meet again in person. For me, after two years, it's also, it's also a pleasure. We have been uh, discussing remotely for two years, so it's a great opportunity. I hope uh, an interesting exchange of views. And yeah, it will be, it will be a, a great opportunity to have a vision and a, a confrontation of the environmental threats, economic threats, and the impact of security in our region. And in a moment like this that Alec, uh, Arthur will, will share with us. <clears throat> so 
to begin with, I would like to commend my second committee colleagues. I already did it, but also the rapporteur, Kudron Krugler, for the dedication. And I also would like to say thank you to the, all the team, to Marco, to Irina, to Anja, because without them, this work would not be possible. So thank you very much again, Marco, and all the team. <coughs> so, and as a result of all these months, today we'll be hearing from our rapporteur about a wide range of complex and interlinked challenges, recommendations to overcome and to overcome them. Um, <coughs> I said that uh, Arthur will intervene also. And I would like to start with the idea that the concept of economic and environmental security is more than critical than ever, especially considering the latest developments. I think that it's a new political order, so we have an opportunity to accelerate change. Change means today energy transition, but means also save the planet and save the future of our generations. And uh, I, would say, I would say that it's also, it also means fair change. And it's obvious that the war in Ukraine has plunged global food markets into turmoil, where growing demand cannot be met, thereby raising high food prices even further and severely, and severely limiting people's access to food. Recent reports by the United Nations paint a dramatic picture 1.7 billion people will be affected by the current crisis, which could generate famine, desperation, and widespread insecurity both across and around our region. Moreover, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has roiled the markets and geopolitics of energy, driving, uh, driving oil and gas prices to the highest levels in nearly a decade, and forcing many to reconsider their energy supplies. Uncertainties about Russian supplies are also increasing market instability, driving up volatility and prices even further. Ultimately, the war has significantly strained economic relations in the OC region, and it's impacting negatively, negatively on all citizens. I think that it's obvious that inflation is today for us a sign of inequality for, for our societies. And finally, armed conflicts have an appalling, an appalling impact on the environment by producing extensive amounts of greenhouse gases and significantly polluting nearby land, air, and water, thus representing a serious assault to citizens' health. Against this complex background, promoting security and stability in the OC area through sound and sustainable economic and environmental policies is the only way forward. In doing so, we shall be guided by the following principles. I will start first with the, with the idea that we have to go green, become green, actually. We need to invest heavily in greening our economies. In this regard, I am proud that our committee continues to take an active approach in linking economic recovery, green transition, and environmental protection considerations. There is no way around it. Our economic development model should be made more sustainably, sustainable, fair, solidar, solidar, and safe. To do so, we should work hand in hand with health experts, scientists, and economists to create new development opportunities, including by exploiting new technologies. I am delighted to report that our committee has further expanded its network of collaborations with leading stakeholders across the OC region. We have joined the United Nations Mediterranean Commission on Sustainable Development of the Barcelona Convention last January, in January 2022. So through this platform, the OCPA will be more visible and directly involved in relevant international projects aimed at addressing growing environmental and development-related challenges in the Mediterranean region. So I had, the, I had the pleasure to visit the United Nations Development Program in Athens in May. And among the common priorities identified future water cooperation, biodiversity protection, and fighting environmental pollution were, were one, of the, one of them. So the second principle, protecting the environment equals protecting ourselves. I think this is key. By now, it should be clear that to all, it should be clear to all that uh, an advanced environmental agenda is also a strong public health agenda. Mitigating the impact of climate change and environmental degradation must therefore remain a priority of the, inter of the international community, despite uh, everything. 
There can be no global security without climate security. And I think after these last six months, we can certificate that this is more important than ever. This is why we issued the parliamentary plea for resolute climate action in November, where we exhorted OC governments to do more in mitigating and adapting to climate change, but also underlined the important role of the parliamentarians in this context. We are key, actually. As parliamentarians, we should shape national leg legislation and mobili mobilize adequate resources to first safeguard our planet's ecosystems, second, reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, and third, slow the rate of increase in average temperature. So we should also carefully ponder the difference between and within countries to understand how the climate crisis, crisis impacts local dynamics and communities different leads. It's always, a, it's always a, a paradox, Marco, but let's be frank, the crisis is global. The impact is mainly local. If you look at the temperatures in the last months in, in the Mediterranean, for example, where I come from, it's obvious. As we, as we underlined well in advance, the key to the success of many of these four efforts rests with our current and future energy policies. This brings me to the last and third principle. The energy transition is urgent and no longer delayable. It's, I would say it's not for tomorrow, it's for now, it's for today. Since over 70% of human caused greenhouse gases, gas emissions stem from the energy sector, greening the latest is key to saving our species and planet, while also creating new development opportunities. We urgently need to boost energy efficiency and profoundly reconsider the way we produce and consume energy. This is a systemic shift that will have geopolitical and economic effects that go far beyond the energy sector. In, in other words, what can we do for our planet and we can do for our future generations, for our children? Both the climate crisis and the war in Ukraine are urging us to embrace a transition that shall be cornered around renewable sources of energy rather than on traditional fossil fuels. As the height of an energy emergency that is greatly impacting citizens and their way of living, we finally realize that such a transition needs to be faster. In fact, much faster than we ever thought. And for that, political will is the most, the most powerful tool. With this in mind, we held a super timely parliamentary web dialogue on the clean energy revolution and its implications for the OCE region in February to frame the latest geopolitical developments, explore potential socioeconomic and environmental implication and boost collaboration in this context. We should not lose, lose this momentum to positively change the way we live. And we have an incredible opportunity ahead of us. Every decision we take in this process is affecting people's life and future. We simply cannot afford to leave anyone behind. So, and dear colleagues, I encourage you all to keep up this critical line of work and become true agents of change the, the time to act is, is now, and our Assembly's uniqueness comes from its comprehensive understanding of security in which economy, science, technology, and the environment are integral and fundamental elements. So I wish you all a very successful deliberation. And um, before giving the floor to Gudrun, I think it's, a, it's an important, I think it's an opportunity after my, my speech, more, 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 more theoretic, to give the floor to Arthur, who, who can maybe share his views on the impact of the Ukrainian war, first on the ground, but also on the energy, on the energy crisis and the food crisis. So, uh, Arthur, thank you very much for being here with us. It's a super pleasure. I was in, in, in Kiev on Monday. I asked if you were around, but you were in Vos Vaso looking for visa. So, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. The floor is yours, Arthur. Uh, thank you very much, dear Per, dear Gudrun, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, I want to say that the full-scale Russian invasion to Ukraine, which started on February 24, has revealed how fragile our international system is. The international community has not managed with the prevention of the most brutal and cruel war of the 21st century. At the beginning of the Russian full-scale invasion, the intensive hostilities were conducted on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Since the moment when our world was on the brink of nuclear catastrophe, 
when the Russian troops deliberately opened fire near nuclear facilities. The situation has not changed much. The Zaporizhian nuclear station is under occupation right now. And I can tell you the following thing. Zaporizhian nuclear station, missiles are flying on a permanent basis over the station. And taking into account my own experience and the experience, for example, of Victoria Kensburska from our delegation, who is from Kharkiv, you know the name of this city. Russian missiles can fly to one place, but because of their poor quality or other reasons, they can explode in totally other place. And that's why you only can imagine what will be, not with Ukraine only, but with all neighbors in case nuclear station will explode. All of us saw Chernobyl case in the 20th century. Also, due to the ongoing Russian aggression, many existing universal challenges have been seriously exacerbated. In particular, in light of the interconnectivity of the environment, we know that our country's commitments on climate change are relevant only when all countries fulfill them. Russian air strikes on our oil depots, chemical plants, and water facilities, as well as other critical infrastructure, are not only taking innocent people's lives, destroying our economy, but are also affecting our commitments on climate change. And we also need to take it into account. And the environmental damage caused by the Russian invasion affects health as well-being of the Ukrainian population, and in a long-lasting perspective, will reflect on the environment of the entire OEC area. And uh, also, we need to understand that significant amounts of pollutants and greenhouses gases are released into the air due to the shellings and their strikes along with destroyed by uh, uh, all of our objects by Russian air strikes, wetlands, grasslands, and pastures, which are major carbon sinks. They are destroying all that stuff. And to give you just one concrete example, as a result of a fire caused by Russian attacks, more than 17,000 hectares of forest in protected areas of Luhansk region were already not even damaged, destroyed. This is just one example. But these examples are all around Ukraine. I was driving Kyiv region, which was freed by Ukrainian army, and we have many forests destroyed by the air by uh, artillery of Russian invaders. In general, as of May 27, the Special Task Force of the State Ecological Inspectorate of Ukraine recorded 257 crimes against the environment committed by the invaders. This is one particular direction, environmental crimes. I'm not telling about thousands and thousands of crimes against humanity, crimes against Ukrainian people, crimes against Ukraine. But this is just one example about the uh, environment crimes. And uh, also, speaking on universal threats, which were considerably aggravated by Russia war aggression, I would also like to mention another example of the overall consequences of the Russian war of aggression that affect countries far beyond Ukraine. When the world was slowly recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic, national economies needed stability and cooperation the most. Instead, by its invasion of Ukraine and further deliberated blockade of the Ukrainian ports, you know the story. And mining of the Black Sea, Russia has led our world to the age of global food insecurity. And according to the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Production of Ukraine, now more than 20 million tons of grain are not on the world market uh, and are now in Ukraine because of the seaport blockade. And just provide you the level of this catastrophe. Please, don't see only the figure 20 million. 20 million, this is only the grain from the year 2021. Also, please take into account that because of the war, this year, Ukraine will not collect approximately 25 million tons. Yes, we will collect a huge number of grain, but the difference the delta between, let's say, peace time and this time will be approximately 25 million tons. And also, please take into account that because of the war, Ukraine will not seed, will not start, let's say, the grain of year 2023. So immediately we have around 70 million tons of, let's say, shortage on the world markets. And 
I can tell you the following thing, that uh, we understand it, that this is Russian plan. This is Russian plan, because they want to organize food crisis far from Ukraine, in Africa, in other countries of the world. And by that, they want to increase migration. We understand that in case of food, a shortage of food, people start to migrate. And this is also the plan of Russia, and we need to spend now huge efforts, because now this is like chain. First part of the chain, second part of the chain, third part of the chain, in case we will not stop Kremlin. They will give results. They will receive results in this area. Uh, also, I need to say that because of the uh, invasion, we have now huge ecological, ecological catastrophe on all the areas which were occupied and which were freed as well. Because number of uh, bullets, number of ammunition, number of not exploded ammunition, number of mines on this territory, it's for at least for 10, 15 years of, you know, very complicated work. And uh, this is now influencing not only ecological situation in Ukraine, but also it's influencing ecological situation at least of our neighbors, but all the OEC region. Also, I need to tell thank you very much for all countries who now supporting Ukrainian refugees, but just think about the figures. Five million refugees, more than seven million IDPs inside the country, seven millions. And we need to understand, in case Russia will be as much successful in Ukraine, they will go further. And these five million refugees will be 50 million refugees. Think globally about it. Understand the Russian plans now, in the beginning, when you can defeat Russia by hands of our soldiers, by hands of Ukrainians. We are ready to do that. Just provide for us weaponry and increase sanctions. Otherwise, instead of 5 million refugees, you will have 50 million refugees. If you now will not unblock supports of Ukraine, you will receive also increase of migration from other countries. This is the plan of Russia. Think globally. How to do that? Just to stop oil ships of Russia all around the world. That's it. Russia immediately will become much more communicative in the question of unblocking of Ukrainian supports. When we are speaking about other, let's say, things, I really want openly to recommend all countries to be prepared for. Russia now, on purpose, destroying civilian infrastructure. Water supply, electricity supply, heat supply, all the stuff, all around Ukraine, all around Ukraine. So, when you are thinking about anti missile defense, when you are thinking about, uh, let's say, air defense, think not only about military objects, think extremely carefully about protecting of your critical civilian infrastructure because Russia is destroying it, especially when the war is done during the winter time. Next point, I want really to recommend you. In Ukraine now, we adopted a special law in the parliament. We, I'm from opposition. Now there is ruling party, but it doesn't matter. Now we are one team, we are soldiers who are now working for victory. And now we adopted the special law about relocation of the strategic enterprises. It doesn't mean only state enterprises. You now, and this is my advice to all your countries, you need to create a list of enterprises. Doesn't matter, private, state, mid-level business, let's say big business, doesn't matter, because sometimes small enterprise can produce small part, small spare part, but it will be extremely critical for your, for example, water supply. And you must have the plan how to relocate them in case of invasion. Believe me, better to have this plan because you will save lives, you will save time, and you will be much more prepared for the invasion. And last two things I wanted to tell, like, you know, advisors, of course, it's very sad to 
understand that this advice is from real world, because I want you to provide this advisor this kind of advice, reading the books about, let's say, Second World War, something like that. But now I'm telling that from our own experience. I saw it personally. All of Ukrainians now feel it personally. Shelters in the schools and kindergartens. It's a must. It's a must. And uh, another thing, be prepared for it. And Ukraine, by the way, was well prepared for it because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, possibility of online education. You need to have these courses. You need to be prepared. It's not an easy task. We spent months of time. We spent efforts of thousands of teachers. We spent huge money to create these, you know, online educational courses. Because you need to do to have it for the kindergartens. You need to have it, for example, for physics, for mathematics, for etc., etc., etc. But now. Our children, who are now out of the country, also have possibility to study through the online. Be ready for that. This is my another advice. And last but not least, uh, invaders. Now, you know, all economical, all technological things now are very interconnected. In any, let's say, device, you can find spare parts from Europe, from North America, from other countries. And recently, not only recently, on a permanent basis, what we're realizing, we destroying many Russian techniques. Uh, missiles, tanks, uh, their drones. And you know what is very sad? It's very sad. Almost in all of them, we are fighting spare parts from European countries. And what is even more sad, produced after 2014, when the military industry of Russia was under sanctions. And we have all this. This is the evidences with the numbers, with the production facilities, addresses, etc., etc., etc. That's why I'm kindly asking you, first of all, be very strict in sanctions against those, especially military producers in your own countries, who is providing their spare parts for the missiles which are killing people. Now, now, and the second part, please stop any technological cooperation with the country who is now killing people. When somebody, somebody in your countries, from business circles, I know how they tell it because before the politics I was all my life in business, start to tell that we need to develop business, this is job places, etc. Just tell them three words. Bucha, Irpin, and Mariupil. Just them go to Google and see the photos. And in Mariupil, according to latest evaluations, more than 50,000 civilians killed, totally destroyed half a million cities, totally destroyed city pictures. That's all, Per, I wanted to tell. And uh, that's kind of advice I wanted to share with you, with purpose, your countries, be ready more for the possible aggression from the Russian side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Artur. <laughs> Thank you very much, Artur, for your comment. And I, I, will have, will I, so I would like to make the point on this idea of ecological war. I think it's a very interesting point. Uh, there are some articles on, on that concept, this, this idea of, concept of ecological war that helps to animate the debate. And before I give the floor to Gudrun, just may I remind colleagues that the election, the election of the committee officers for the next annual session of the assembly will take place during the final, during the committee's final session, which is likely to take place 
on Tuesday morning. Nominations for candidates for election should be handed in to the table, no late to the table office, of course, no later than the, st the start of that meeting, nine o'clock on Tuesday morning. So this is the timeline. So the committee is scheduled to have four meetings during the session. So this is the first one. In this first meeting, we will consider the draft resolution and report from Rapporteur Ms. Gudrun Kugler, and we will also consider uh, amendments to this resolution, time permitting. So uh, in addition, this committee has been tasked by the standing committee to debate and consider three supplementary items covering the following, the following issues. Draft resolution on a code of conduct for members of the OCPA proposed by Irene Charambidis. Draft resolution on implementing the UN SDG in the OC area proposed by Mr. Shakiro from Kazakhstan. And a draft resolution on accelerating the green energy transition proposed by Mr. Aldak from Canada. Eight amendments have been tabled to these supplementary items. So we will consider supplementary items when our main business on the draft resolution is concluded. So now is the time for the report. Kudrun, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning to everyone. And I maybe want to start by saying thank you for the depth that our discussion has already had this morning. And I think this is great and appropriate to what's happening. Um, I would like to uh, walk with you briefly uh, through what uh, we have done in order to produce the report and the draft resolution uh, so that we have a frame for our discussion. And I cannot do so without saying a thank you from all of my heart to the people that you can see here on the podium who have done an absolutely tremendous job and put so much time and expertise into this. And I want to say thank you to our chair, Pere Pons, and to Arthur Gerasimov as the vice chair, and also to the incredible uh, members of the Secretariat, Marco Bonabello, Anja, I can see here, who have worked on this really not for weeks, but for months. And um, you have read the text, they are lengthy, I apologize for this, but you have seen that this is substantial work and it was produced by a very good way of cooperation. I also would like to say thank you to a number of special rapporteurs that have helped us. And I'm speaking here of rapporteurs of OSE PA and also of those uh, from the OSCE uh, as well. We have tried to look into all the issues that are key for the second committee and then talk to all of these rapporteurs because these people have all the expertise, they work on this on a daily basis and we went there and we said what, is, what are your key ideas and we tried to introduce most of what they've said into this report. Now, we have built on two things. You should, uh, you should hear that. One is that in the last two years, because of COVID, there were only reports, but no resolutions. And so we have tried to take the key findings of the uh, reports of the last years also into our work now, so that what was worked on would not get lost. And at this point, I would also like to say a very special thank you to Ilona from, from Albania. Most of you know her, who has done an incredible job. And we tried to make sure that her ideas do not get lost. We tried to incorporate them. The second thing we built upon that you um, uh, should be aware of is that the second committee has done a number of activities and where we brought together experts, different stakeholders. And we also tried to use these ideas for our report and resolution. Just to mention a few, a uh, special meeting on energy transition, combating corruption, combating human trafficking, and our letter to the COP26 in Glasgow that uh, you are aware of. All of this means a lot of work, meant a lot of work for Marco and Anja and all of us. And we used the findings and the key uh, consensus principles of all of these meetings to pull them into report and resolution for this committee. Now, there um, was another principle that was very important for me as a rapporteur, and that is that as politicians, and I think all of you are here in the same boat, we tend to, be, uh, we tend to focus a lot on daily business, right? So this is big in the newspapers, we take it up, we look for solutions. This is right and it's important. But at the same time, we must never overlook big questions that are maybe not so much in the foreground in the media, but that are key in the midterm and the uh, mid, uh, midterm, but also the long run. 
And I think this really distinguishes good politics from populistic politics, that we think of the big problems, even if they do not have so much attention of the public. So we tried in our report to also look into issues that are maybe not so apparent in the public debate, but absolutely key for the OSCE region. Uh, and in doing so, we realized um, that the second committee and the uh, focus area, maybe you could say, was a bit neglected over the last decades. There was the first committee and the third committee, and then the second committee was like, you know, for those who didn't know where, where, where else to go. But this has changed. The second committee really is the future committee. This is where we are looking together for answers and ways of cooperation for the key questions of our time, for the key crises that we have. And um, many things that we heard from Arthur and also from Pere already this morning, the crisis and the uncertainties of our time, many of these issues now are on the table of the second committee. And it's very obvious in all of this how security is interlinked with economy, with environment, and with science and technology. And it's becoming more and more apparent. So what did we do in the report? We began with, of course, talking about the war and its detrimental effects on the people, economy, but also environment, as we have just heard from Arthur. And we go on to look into the issue of economy, and we specified six key areas. You have all seen it. Just to remind you, one issue, of course, is COVID recovery. Another issue are demographic challenges. Maybe this is one thing we are not reading in the newspaper so much about, but that is quite a factor in our region in, in different ways of how it portrays itself. We talked as a, as a third chapter, we talk about economic interdependence, but also economic independence. Another key issue, as we can see right now so apparently. We talk about migration management. You see the movements also we have in the region. We talk about combating human trafficking in globalized economies. Now, many of you might think, oh, human trafficking goes into the human rights issues. But it's also an issue of economy, and the supply chain debate makes that very clearly, uh, uh, very obvious. And we also talk about combating corruption and good governance. That's the economy area. Then within the environmental area, we focus on sustainable development, of course, climate change, clean energy transition, and environmental protection and sustainable use of natural resources. You know, things that we have been talking about for a long time, but again, they become more and more striking as we look into the current debates we are having. Within science and technology, as uh, always, we focus on a strong science and policy interface. This is key. We cannot do politics without being in very close touch with science and, uh, and, and uh, latest developments. But then we also look into a common response to artificial intelligence and a common response to how to deal with a digitalized world where we do see lots of advantages, but also dangers. And we see the power that social media has over our countries and uh, the dangers that are attached to that. So that's all things that we need to be, look at to get, need to be looking at together. And this report proposes solutions. So to finish, I would first of all like to apologize again for the length of these documents. This really is a result of uh, COVID and uh, not having this, uh, some of these documents in the previous years. Secondly, I would like to um, emphasize that there, ha there are a lot of commitments we have on the sustainable development and climate change front that we are underlining here. And we say we have these commitments. Please take them seriously. And thirdly, we have a number of suggestions on issues that are key for security and cooperation in the region, where we propose, in a way, new ideas of how to tackle them together. And on the basis of all of this, I'm very much looking forward to working with you on these texts, hearing your thoughts about it. And please um, be, um, 
do know that I will be taking careful note of your ideas in case something has not been uh, co um, incorporated yet. I will be very happy to take it uh, into our work also for the subsequent months. So thank you for taking your time working on these documents and I'm looking forward to a fruitful debate. So thank you very much, Kudrun. You mentioned the idea of economic independence, human traffic versus economy, and the idea of not being only on daily business, etc. So I think the, the debate will be very rich. And before starting the debate, I would like to say, first of all, thank you to the interpreters, but also to say that we are all on board and we can translate in all languages, all official languages of the OC now. So the translation is, is in all in our languages. And the second thing is that the, uh, the floor is open for the debate. Uh, I would say that if there is any other person who wants to be added to the list, it's now or never because we are already um, a lot on the list. And I would say that the maximum time of speech is, is three minutes. So please um, stick to this three minutes if you don't mind. So uh, the first person in, on the list is Mrs. Kari Henriksen for Norway, and he, she will be followed by Mr. Christian Senekis. So, Kari, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Kugler, for a very good report. Uh, in a broad definition of security, the economic aspects play an important role. An uncertain economic future can create unrest in the population. As we can currently see in Europe, rising energy prices and the general consequences of the war in Ukraine have led to greater uncertainty. It is essential to work together to deal with these consequences of the Ukraine war. As pointed out in the report of Ms. Kugler, food security, as Ukraine acts as a cru crucial supplier of agricultural goods for many countries, the situation around the Ukrainian nuclear power plants and the high number of refugees and IDPs are consequences we need to meet. Technology and new means of production can make it easier to meet the climate-related and technology challenges, which we will have to meet in tandem. In these uncertain times, we have to go back to our roots and fundamental values outlined in the Helsinki Final Act from 1975. If we don't succeed, many countries may experience unrest, rebellion, and division. They are door openers for uncertainty and conflict. War is the most dramatic door opener of all. I was myself visiting Kyiv, Butcha, and Irpin uh, the attacks on civilian goals is totally not acceptable. War leads to deep divisions, to hatred between people and countries, major loss of human life, enormous human suffering, destruction of the climate and huge economic costs follow from a war. All which are threats to our security. No one is safe if not everybody is safe. And in war, the biggest losers, losers are usually women and children. Therefore, we need to, uh, to use our gender knowledges to in protection of our countries and civil, civil society. The OSCEPA should help to minimize the damage by addressing the hatred, building bridges, and finding coherent international solutions. International cooperation on the economic costs of rebuilding post-war societies should also be specifically directed at finding opportunities for women and children. Health and education will enable women and children to contribute to the country's economic in the rebuilding which is needed. At the same time, we must work tirelessly to develop new technology to secure new economic growth. Viewing climate change, technology, economic growth, and cooperation as a coherent whole is essential for meeting the challenges in the future. This must be a key point in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Henderson. And then the floor is for Mr. Christos Senekis from Cyprus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear colleagues, 
Thank you for this opportunity to comment on the excellent report prepared by the rapporteur of our committee, Mrs. Kugler. We are indeed in the middle of some of the darkest moments in the post-Cold War era. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has uh, opened Pandora's box, fueling a global food and energy crisis. Strict sanctions imposed on Russia by the international community have further exacerbated the economic security in our region, threatening stability. At this uh, critical juncture, energy transition is becoming more relevant than ever. There is an urgent need of, to diversify Europe's energy sources and strengthen security of energy supply. The energy reserves in the Eastern Mediterranean region, including those in Cyprus' exclusive economic zone, have the potential to render our, our region a significant alternative energy option for Europe. Cyprus is also progressing regarding the materialization of Euro-Asia Interconnector, a European project of common interest which will connect Cyprus and Israel to continental Europe through Greece, ending the energy isolation of Cyprus and ensuring at the same time energy security of the European Union by providing sufficient electricity generated from solar and re renewable energy sources. Regarding the key challenge of climate change for Cyprus, the transition to a green economy and the achievement of climate neutrality is a strategic goal based on its commitments stemming from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the European Green Deal, and the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. In this context, at the initiative of Cyprus, a um, 10 year regional action plan is being developed ahead of head of state summit uh, to be held next October uh, for the ratification and official launch of the initiative. The second ministerial meeting for the climate change in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East who, um, was hosted in Cyprus last month. Um, I also welcome the reference made in the report about the migration management and the demographic changes. Uh, relating to this topic, I would like to underline that for the fifth consecutive year, the uh, Republic of Cyprus is experiencing the unacceptable instrumentalization of asylum seekers by Turkey, making Cyprus the country with the largest number of asylum seekers among EU member states per capita, who account more than 5% of the total population. In this regard, we welcome as a positive development the proposals of outgoing French presidency of the Council in the EU aimed at enhancing much needed solidarity and a fairer share of responsibilities between states. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Senekis. And um, first, we have um, first Ms. Christine Telman from Romania, followed by Mr. Eldresven from Canada, and then Ms. Brock from the United Kingdom. So, Ms. Telman, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Dear Ms. Rapporteur Kugler, congratulations, first of all, for your excellent report. Please allow me to convey to my appreci appreciation for the extensive report and for the activities of our, of our committee. Dear colleagues, I would like to emphasize the economic consequences of the war in Ukraine. The current situation, security context has led to social difficulties caused by rising energy prices and the risk of economic problems. For Romania, this situation is further complicated by the fact that our country is in close proximity to the conflict zone. Regarding Ukraine's food security, Romania has assured its Ukrainian partners that it will be act both bilaterally and multilaterally through its member organizations to support Ukraine at all levels. At the same time, Romania is ready to assume a regional role in the post-war reconstruction of the neighboring country, thus also helping the hard-pressed Romanian community there. As you know, Romania has provided multidimensional support to Ukraine. 
We want to limit the effects of the global food crisis by facilitating the transport of U Ukraine carriers to Romania and by offering alternative routes for the ex export of grain from Ukraine. Since the outbreak of the conflict in, uh, in that zone, more than 600,000 tons of grain from U U Ukraine have been exported through the port of Constanza. It is still very important to take into account the reconstruction process in Ukraine, both strategically and financially. To this end, all available instruments should be used. We have an energy crisis and we have a war crisis in Ukraine. In this context, the priorities both at national level and at the level of each state in the region are changing. I do hope we will manage to provide the right answer to what people expect from us. We need to create the new policies in order to help the population dealing with the current challenges. Thank you and I do hope this annual session will further contribute to do good in our nation region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Telman. Now the floor is for Mr. Dresson and then followed by uh, Ms. Brock. Thank you. I'm uh, Earl Dreschen, a member of parliament from Canada, a farmer, former math and physics teacher. Throughout this report, we constantly hear that the energy source that has made this world an hospitable place for the last century and a half has little value in today's society. We are now experiencing the consequences of restrictive fossil fuel policy, both in Europe on the production side, as in, in Canada's case, restrictions on potential global outreach, leading to inflated consumer prices and to manufacturing supply side upheaval. As privileged nations, we have chosen the route of fossil fuel demonization and no longer even give lip service to the benefits our nations have received from this highly transportable and compact energy source. And we never recognize how much hydrocarbons have freed up our citizens to pursue their dreams and aspirations. We speak of potential climate catastrophe in the future as inevitable, but never recognize that there has been a 98% reduction in climate-related deaths in the last century. The amazing dike systems we built, the desalination of seawater, the management of critical infrastructure, the advancement of food production, the production of nitrogen fertilizer from natural gas, as well as the energy required to ensure our national security has been built and managed by human ingenuity and labor-saving machinery powered by hydrocarbons. It is true that the burning of fossil fuels will add to greenhouse gas levels. However, the wise use of this resource will, as it has in the past, help us not only cope with this inevitability, but master the effects as well. There are many of us in this room that will find it hard to make such a paradigm shift in thinking. But to start the conversation, I have, as the Vice Chair of our House of Commons Environmental Committee, asked for a detailed study on clean fuel technology. And once that is completed, I would be happy to share the results with fellow OSCE members. As a mathematician, my goal is to ensure that the metrics used for all technologies, past, present, and future, is clear and comprehensive. Whatever the energy source, including its storage and distribution system, it's imperative that we measure the environmental and human consequences that exist from the first shovel needed to dig it up to the last shovel needed to cover it up. Once that is clear, we can then assess whether our strategies are consistent with our goals. In the meantime, we do all humanity and injustice by cutting off or restricting our globally necessary and abundant hydrocarbon source. As appealing as many renewable energy sources are, they cannot be built without fossil fuels. War-torn nations cannot be rebuilt without fossil fuels. And as been evidenced by our European friends that are now re-engaging coal and nuclear power generation to cope with the consequences of relying on conflict oil, a different approach is paramount. Together, we can make the difference that our people deserve. Let us be open to such a dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dresden. So now uh, I'll give the floor to Ms. Brock and followed by Mr. Said Kirazoglu from Turkey. Uh, thank you, Chair. And it's a great pleasure to be among you for the first time since I became a member of the OSCEPA. And I look forward to meeting more uh, of you at the events later today. I also wish to thank Artur and the other Ukrainian delegates for their presence, their bravery, and their eloquence on behalf of their people. 
I very much welcome the rapporteur's report and the strong support shown in it and in the resolution for the concepts of a sustainable economic recovery from the pandemic and for the continued promotion of cross-regional responses, particularly at this time of Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine and a global climate crisis. The inclusion of environmental factors in the OSCE's concept of security is most welcome. Global warming and its impact threaten our shared security and prosperity and can only be addressed through collective action and multilateral cooperation. The OSCE will add real value to these pressing global problems by playing a valuable role in security-linked environmental issues such as water management. The strides forward that states took at Glasgow's COP26 resulted in the Glasgow Climate Pact and strengthened NDCs and show real progress ultimately can be achieved, targets can be achieved or even surpassed, and they will accelerate the shift to clean, decarbonized economies for us all and achieve more local, secure, renewable energy. We're fortunate in Scotland, where uh, I am from, to have an estimated 25% of Europe's wave and wind power, and we are powering ahead with offshore wind and marine energy projects, developing green hydrogen production and carbon capture storage, and working hard towards a just green transition, vitally important for our workers and industries. I've been pleased to hear of the tremendous progress that OSCE states here have made too, and I look forward to us continuing to share best practice with each other as we strive towards the world's 1.5 degree target and the biodiversity targets that must also be an intrinsic part of our consideration for the environment. Together we can do it, but it will require cooperation and shared endeavor. But that's the sort of cooperation and shared endeavor that is displayed in great measure by states here in standing up against Russia's aggressive invasion of Ukraine. In closing, we strongly welcome the OSCE's inclusion of economic and environmental factors in its concept of security and look forward to us all working together on the challenges that we face. Thank you, thank you very much, Ms. Brock. And then um, following Mr. Kirazoglu, we'll, we'll have the floor, Mr. John Aldak from Canada. So, Mr. Kirazoglu, the floor is yours from Turkey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me start by thanking Rapporteur Gurdin Kugler for her comprehensive report and draft resolution. The report is relatively long but comprises almost all high topics within the mandate of the second committee. As it is the case in the other committees, we discuss all these issues against the backdrop of Russian aggression towards Ukraine. Inevitably, there will be many repercussions of this war in the economic and environmental field. In this respect, food security is definitely one of the ma major concerns. Turkey is working hard to exp explore ways to export Ukrainian wheat and grain to the international markets in coordination with the UN. Secure corridors are needed. We are in close contact with both sides. Another area of concern is energy security. In order to reduce energy dependence, it is a gentle to consider energy demand dynamics and supply security requirements. We understand the EU's political will to reduce its energy dependence on Russia. However, the action in this direction need to be strategically well calibrated and result-oriented. Yet we see further increases in energy prices in parallel with the sanctions in the area of energy. It seems that natural gas will maintain its importance in ensuring energy security when reducing dependence on gas and oil imports, predictive planning should be maintained. With regard to the climate change, we share your assessment, Ms. Rapporteur. Most developed countries and the largest emitters shall lead by example in this field. We must not forget that developing nations are the most severely affected and, at the same time, the least responsible for climate change. All countries should cooperate in the implementation of the agreed commitments in line with the principle of common but different responsibilities and respective capabilities in light of different national circumstances. In this field, we also value our committee leaders the initiative parliamentary player for resolute climate action. 
It contains several important elements, yet it is not reflecting all views in the Parliamentary Assembly and may give a wrong impression as if all elements therein are endorsed by all member states. There are still diverging views about the climate security nexus while recognizing its threat multiplier impact. Approaches to portray environmental problems and climate change as the direct root cause of conflicts or migrant flows may mislead the international community while seeking for solutions to the real root causes of these conflicts and consequent migratory flows. Finally, we reject what my Greek colleagues just claimed. Turkey, as the largest refugee hosting country in the world for almost 10 years, has no policy to instrumentalize the migrants, but is very worried about the violation of migrants' fundamental rights through, through inhuman pushbacks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kriazoglu. And uh, following Mr. Uh, Aldak from Bangalore, uh, Ms. Alexandra Tavares de Mora will have the floor. So, Mr. Aldak, the floor is yours now. Good morning and thank you. I'd like to thank Ms. Kugler for the work and time invested in preparing this ambitious report as well as a draft resolution. The report touches on a number of important topics, including the need to ensure a sustainable economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic to monitor demographic challenges in the region and to redouble global efforts to combat climate change. The report also emphasizes the nexus between sustainable development and security. As Ms. Kugler has explained, war and instability arise not only from political and military threats, but also from economic tensions, environmental competition and degradation, and social instability. Making the link between these types of threats lies at the heart of the OSCE's comprehensive approach to security, and it is a critical component of the work of this committee. I'm going to take a bit of time to offer a slightly different perspective from Canada than my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Dreschen. I'm going to focus my comments on climate change, energy security, and Russia's war on Ukraine. To begin, I'd like to strongly support the rapporteur's call to urgently redirect our efforts toward shaping a truly sustainable and carbon neutral economic development model. A shift in this direction complements a supplementary item that I have proposed on accelerating the green energy transition. Colleagues, as you know, climate change is a global challenge that no country is immune from. In Canada, the impacts of climate change are clear and costly. The Canadian North is warming at about three times the global average. Increasing temperatures are resulting in decreased ice thickness, the melting of permafrost, coastal erosion and rising sea levels. For people closely associated with the land, such as our, uh, the Indigenous peoples in uh, Canada's uh, North and uh, throughout Canada, these changes risk affecting their culture, traditions and social well-being. While all countries must do their part to address the consequences of climate change, wealthy industrialized nations, including Canada, bear a particular responsibility. Ahead of COP26 in Glasgow, Canada submitted an enhanced nationally determined contribution plan that raised its emissions reduction target to 40 to 45 percent below 2005 by 2030. And this is up from a previous target of 30 percent below 2005 levels. This enhanced target is in line with Canada's target of reaching net zero emissions by 2050. Through the, although these commitments are important, we know there is much more to do. Looking ahead to COP27 in Egypt, wealthy industrialized countries need to strengthen their climate targets and provide increased financial support to assist in developing countries as they mitigate and adapt to the effects of climate change. And energy security is also important, and I hope we have a chance to deal with that, but I'd like to conclude by uh, noting that Russia's barbaric attacks have caused untold pain and suffering, uh, suffering for Ukrainians. At this very moment, the people of Ukraine are fighting for the survival of their country, their communities, and their cultural identity. I encourage us all to keep that struggle at the front of our minds throughout our debates today and over the course of the annual session. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Aldak. And uh, Mr. Gumar Dizimbayev will follow Ms. Tavares de Moura. Mr. Barz Damola, you float. Thank you. No, no, no. no. Uh, first, Ms. Damola, the Damola, and then you will have the floor. Sorry. Okay. Dear President, dear colleagues, it's an honor to be here and discuss the economic affairs and the rule of women 
at this specific moment of our history. In all democracies, we assist in the increasing of the rules that improve our society by getting a gender balance in all areas, as we know, in positions of power, in economic affairs, or in combating gender violence. We know that democracies are as balanced as the number of women present where the decisions are made, and that is an objective that we can't never forget. As we know, the context of COVID-19 pandemic, gender considerations must be an integral part of emergency answers. But we must ensure that gender considerations are mainstreamed across the policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic. While all women in different sectors were affected by the economic impacts of the pandemic in various ways, certain groups were more likely to be severely impacted, including immigrants, women in poverty, and women from minority ethnic backgrounds. This means that we must have a gender lens and take account of the views of diverse groups. If you recognize that women are affected by crises, from health emergence to armed conflicts and wars, OSCE participating states should increase their efforts to promote the involvement of women in decision-making process in the OSCE region and around the world. So, Mr. President, we must discuss the role of women and the reconstruction after this crisis. We can, or we must, face this moment like if it is an opportunity to combat the gender inequality. These are not the last crises. So please, we must be proactive and support the introduction of gender equality and the next crisis. Women shall stand up easily. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. De Moura. So following Mr. Gumar Dijanbayev, um, Mr. Zah will, will, yeah, will have the floor. So the floor is yours. Спасибо, господин спикер. Хочу поблагодарить докладчика нашего комитета, уважаемому госпожу Гудрун Куглер, за интересный доклад, в котором отражены все текущие современные вызовы устойчивого экономического развития и экологической безопасности региона ОБСЕ. Вы акцентировали внимание на важности развития зеленой экономики и перехода к чистой энергетике. В этой связи хочу отметить, что Казахстан намерен довести долю возобновляемой энергетики в общем объеме производства электроэнергии до 6% в 2025 году, к 2030 году до 15%, а к 2050 году на возобновляемые и альтернативные источники энергии должно приходиться не менее половины всего энергопотребления. Принятый экологический кодекс, закон о поддержке использования возобновляемых источников энергии – концепции перехода к зеленой экономике. Мы планируем достичь углеродной нейтральности к 2060 году. В настоящее время разрабатывается концепция низкоуглеродного развития Казахстана до 2050 года. Благодарю за внимание. Спасибо. Mr. Taudin from Mongolia will have the floor. So, Mr. Guliev, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, dear chair, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Since my appointment as the OECPA's special representative on Southeast European region, last August I visited several countries of the region, namely to Greece, Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia, Albania, Montenegro, Romania, and Bulgaria. I am mentioning my visits in order to explain that besides the topics on political and security issues, I also discussed with the host interlocutors the economic and environmental situation, particularly to major challenge for energy and food security. As it is well known, the gas market in Southeast European countries is small scale. Natural gas is a new energy source for these countries some of which lack even the basic natural gas infrastructure, including Albania and Montenegro. The pure gas infrastructure in the region makes the natural gas consumption rate much lower than in other European countries. Currently, the region can cover around 37% of its gas consumption through domestic production. 
The arrest, the arrest is important, imported almost entirely from Russia. Although Bulgaria depends on Russian sources for 80% of the gas consumption and about 20% from Azerbaijan, since the Russian suspension of the gas supply, Bulgaria has increased its gas import from Azerbaijan up to 33% and 17 from the Greece-Bulgaria gas interconnector, which is expected to start operating soon. Bulgaria is planning to ensure that the rest 50% of the gas consumption through LNG imports from the United States and other sources. The trans balkan pipeline will allow Bulgaria to provide gas to neighboring countries, further enhancing cooperation in the region. Dear colleagues, as you know, another big challenge is food security. In many countries, the agriculture sector has the potential to contribute significantly to economic development reduce poverty in, and increase food security. However, these countries' economies assessed as dependent on agriculture are endowed with rich natural resources which allow their agriculture sectors to be economically significant, both in terms of increased value and employment. To achieve these sectors' full economic potential, they need to modernize the equipment and create a stable and sustainable market. I hope they will adjust their production according to the needs that are evident this year of crisis. Lastly, I would like to stress the concern that I have, I have heard during my visit to the region, which is the, which is the depopulation of the countries and the risk of that leading to a lack of labor in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uliev. So now we have three more speakers, and the list is closed. Uh, Mr. Dan from Mongolia, uh, Mr. Bes Mr. Berlakovic from Austria, and then <clears throat> Mr. Jorge Seguro Sanchez from Portugal. He will close this speaker list. So the floor is for the speaker from Mongolia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, the uh, situation unfolding in Central uh, Europe, the armed conflict, is really uh, causing a serious uh, disruption of logistics uh, in the global economy. And the effects, uh, negative effects of the situation is uh, being felt throughout the world. And one of the concerning things that we should be really addressing and thinking of now is uh, this tendency for uh, self-reliance. As a result of sanctions and risk of food shortage, many of the countries are starting to take up the strategy of being self-reliant. Today, in this reality, it sounds very rational and uh, you know, uh, very reasonable, but in reality, what it's leading to is that it's, uh, it's leading to um, strengthening of the tendency of uh, protectionist policies. And this self-reliance philosophy, uh, I think, has a risk of living beyond the conflict itself. And then this, uh, all, you know, post-Cold War, efforts to liberalize global economies in order to, uh, you know, encourage uh, competitiveness, uh, uh, you know, fair uh, competitiveness at the global level. These efforts are really uh, being lost as a result of uh, this national tendencies. And we really should be thinking about this because then at the end, what we will end up having is that very uh, divided world, uh, with strong uh, protectionist policies, and that wouldn't lead to uh, food sufficiency, but it would, on the contrary, lead to food shortage uh, and inefficiency as well. Now, the use of uh, sanctions also, we really would like to, uh, for, you know, uh, uh, the world to think about one thing. When the sanctions are taken, it's ricoch ricocheting to smaller economies that are not party to the conflict. And this is really causing a burden, especially sanctions per se is already slowing global economy and putting a pressure and burden on the economies. In addition to that, this hidden indirect sanctions on other smaller economies is already starting to have its toll on the, uh, you know, uh, economic growth per, uh, perspectives of uh, the economies. 
surrounding the uh, conflict area. And therefore, uh, we really would like to appeal the countries taking sanctions to, th in, in taking and implementing sanctions, to think about not hurting the countries that have nothing to do with uh, the uh, conflict itself. And so this is a very important point that, for example, we, Mongolia, would want to raise here as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dan. Uh, so now we have uh, Mr. Belakovic from Austria. You have the floor. Herzlichen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender. Uh, zuerst einmal darf ich mich bei meiner Kollegin, meiner österreichischen Kollegin Gudrun Kugler, sehr herzlich bedanken. Ich kann Ihnen sagen, sie ist eine sehr, sehr engagierte Frau, die mit sehr viel Herzblut sich für diese Themen einsetzt. Und liebe Gudrun, herzlichen Dank auch noch einmal aus, aus meiner Sicht, aus unserer österreichischen Sicht. Der Bericht spricht zentrale Themen an und der Krieg in der Ukraine hat natürlich neue Prioritäten gesetzt. Aber trotzdem ist es wichtig, dass man den Bereich Klimaschutz und Umweltschutz nicht aus den Augen verliert. Der ukrainische Kollege hat es angesprochen, Kollege Garasimov hat es angesprochen, dass unendliches Leid in der Ukraine passiert, aber dass auch die Umwelt zu Schaden kommt. Daher ist es wichtig, dass diese Themen gerade auch hier in diesem Bericht von der OECD vorangetrieben werden. Österreich ist sehr weit im Ausbau, Ausbau der erneuerbaren Energien. Wir sind zu zwei Drittel, haben wir unsere Stromproduktion im eigenen Land. Aber auch wir brauchen jetzt kurzfristig fossile Energieträger, um Lücken überbrücken zu können. Aber es kann kein Zurück geben hinter das Pariser Klimaschutzabkommen und, und dass wir hier im Klimaschutz nachlassen. Im Gegenteil. Weil der Krieg, der hoffentlich bald zu Ende sein wird, Hoffnung, wird trotzdem zeigen, dass wir im Klimaschutz größere Konflikte verhindern müssen. Daher ist es gut, dass wir sehr wohl jeder Staat für sich überlegen, wie die Energieversorgung auf Erneuerbare umgestellt werden kann, aber dass wir sehr wohl auch gemeinsame Projekte zur Energieversorgung entwickeln müssen. Und die OECD ist ja auch ein, ein, gutes, äh, ein gutes Gremium dafür, eine gute Organisation dafür, weil es letztendlich Sicherheitsfragen sind, wie die Energieversorgung läuft. Auch bei der Lebensmittelversorgung. Der Kollege von der Mongolei hat angesprochen, dass äh, viel über Autarkie gesprochen wird. Es ist schon richtig, dass jeder Nationalstaat dafür sorgt, seine eigene Bevölkerung zu ernähren, seine eigene Bevölkerung mit Lebensmitteln zu versorgen. Aber natürlich ist es auch wichtig, dass wir gemeinsame Projekte zur Sicherung der Ernährung der Weltbevölkerung anstreben. Daher unterstützen wir das sehr stark aus österreichischer Sicht und wollen diese Themen vorantreiben. Und ich glaube, dass die OSZD hier auch einen wichtigen Beitrag dazu leisten kann, Klimaschutz, erneuerbare Energien eben und auch Sicherung mit ausreichend Lebensmittelversorgung, die nachhaltig produziert werden. Daher herzlichen Dank. Und Österreich unterstützt voll die Anstrengungen der OSCT. Dankeschön. Thank you, Mr. Belakovic. So we have, to, we have uh, now Jorge Seguro Sanchez. And uh, I forgot to mention Mrs. Gazan on the list. And she will close the list of speakers today before giving the floor to Ms. Gudrun Kugler to close the debate. So, uh, Mr. Seguro Sanchez, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, dear colleagues, in my first speech in this forum, I would like to stress the need to work more actively in preventive policies in the future. This is the case of energy, which has played a decisive role in the options and international pressure on Russia to accept the basic principles of humanitarian and international law. The war in Ukraine brought to the European space an unthinkable reality with serious global impacts. The crisis that we are seeing in Ukraine must push us to think different and to act better. Energy is one of the most affected sectors. The pressures of energy prices caused by fear to scarcity show us how vulnerable we are and how important it is to have a global vision for this sector. Ensuring security of supply or increasing investments in renewable energy are even more relevant and unquestionable in the context of national defense. This war has revealed the importance of ensuring backups 
and the resilience of our systems in order to reduce security weakness. We think security of supply is relevant to understand whether we can do to reinforcement of interconnections or investments on decentralization empowering the citizens. Only a strong vision can allow us to increase a spirit of cooperation and strength foundations for solidarity among us. I would like to share with everyone our view that the war in Ukraine makes that what was already urgent in terms of energy policies on our planet and in all our countries very urgent. Issues such as security of supply and investment in renewable energies have become unavoidable in discussions on security and defense. Because it does not have fossil energies, Portugal, and let me now share Spain too, one of the countries that we have advanced most in renewable energies is one of the actors of changes in energy policies in European Union and is available to share this good example with all of you. We hope to be able to work together in this mandate, in this plan. Energy is strategic for peace and global security. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Seguro Sanchez. And then um, Ms. Gazan will close the debate. We'll close the debate with, Thank with her last intervention. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to start out by sharing what an honour it is to attend the OSCPA Parliamentary Assembly. And I wish to commend Rapporteur Ms. Uh, Gudron Kugler for tremendous leadership in the development of the report and draft resolution for the Assembly. With that, I wanted to focus on paragraph 20 of the resolution, which notes the Stockholm declarations and draw the Assembly's attention to a gathering that took place this past June commemorating the 1972 United Nations comment Conference on the Human Environment, where Indigenous representatives drafted the Stockholm 50 Indigenous Peoples Declaration. It is critical that we recognize that Indigenous peoples manage and sustain approximately 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity while occupying 25% of the global surface. However, systemic racism resulting in a disregard and violation of the rights of Indigenous peoples, minimum human rights contained in the Articles of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a human rights instrument which has received support from the majority of OSCE participating states not only violates the collective and individual rights of Indigenous peoples, but it also places our environment at risk. We will not be successful in mitigating the climate crisis if there is a failure to uphold Indigenous human rights. Indigenous peoples must be part of the solution and a respect of Indigenous scientific knowledge as a mean of achieving climate goals is critical. We have been on our land since time immemorial and the development occurring on our territories not only frequently violates our human rights but contributes to our climate emergency that we are all faced with. Upholding the rights of Indigenous peoples is central for success. We will not be successful in mitigating the climate crisis in the absence of Indigenous peoples and in violations of Indigenous human rights. This includes the rights of Indigenous women and girls who experience increased violence, including sexual violence and sex trafficking, as a result of resource extraction projects located close to their communities, a crisis noted in the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls in Canada, and a phenomenon occurring throughout the globe, a direct attack on women. So it's for this reasons that I wish to direct the Assembly uh, to the Stockholm 50 Indigenous Peoples Declaration, which calls upon states, United Nations agencies, intergovernmental development organizations, international financial institutions, including public, private, and civil partners to take action and ensure human rights are adhered to, including calling for the protection and halt to the criminalization and killing of Indigenous environmental rights defenders, in addition to other calls to act. Let us not lose sight of the critical importance of upholding human rights, including upholding the rights of Indigenous peoples as we strive to protect Mother Earth. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Gazan. And then uh, after this rich discussion, I let the floor for the rapporteurs from Ms. Udrun Kugler. And then I think we still have five minutes, I think. I, I will not need five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to thank uh, all of you for the very kind words and also for the support that you have expressed for the report and for the resolution. Thank you so much for this. And I would like to encourage you that uh, once uh, the resolution is adopted, that you will really use it in your parliaments. Uh, aspects go to different committees in our national parliaments that you can use the passages and say, this is what 57 parliaments at OSCEPA have agreed upon and help uh, deepen these issues and concerns also in our national parliaments. I also ask you to bring the same concerns that you have so eloquently explained to our plenary sessions. We need to underline uh, the meaning and the, uh, the key role that the second committee plays also in the plenary of OSCEPA. Now, please know that I uh, noted your concerns and I wrote down many points that we together, whoever will be elected um, uh, for the leadership of the second committee will be using uh, for the work to come. Your ideas shall not be forgotten. The notes that all of us took um, underline this. Now, members of parliament are uh, in the driver's seat. It is us to work uh, with our governments on these issues. It's us running, uh, doing a lot within the public debate, and it's really us who need to drive change. And for this, uh, I want to thank you, and I look forward to cooperate even further. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kugler. And uh, I think we have to close the session at 10.30. Um, so I would like to thank you all for all of your interventions. I would, I would, I would like to to close just with three ideas that I heard today, this idea of empower citizenship, it was a very, very stim stimulating concept. The idea of a fair transition, I think it was flowing around all the session, and then this idea of gender equality, which is the next revolution. So thank you very much, and we'll start tomorrow at 9 with all the amendments. Uh, just an example today, for the first amendment, there was no one to promote it. So I hope that you will be all around to promote and defend your amendments tomorrow morning. <laughs> Arthur is ready, but we will wait until tomorrow morning. Thank you very much for all your interventions. Thank you.